Well, we continue our study in faith. You know, faith is not simply intellectual assent, acknowledging spiritual truths. You, you can't be born a child of God. We all need to be born anew, even as Abraham, last week we looked at his life and, and saw how he made certain decisions to follow the Lord and to yield himself to the Lord. And now we have four more examples of faith in the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews was written to the Jewish believers who were struggling with a great many trials, um, testing their faith. And so uh, this was written to them to encourage them through the trials that they were experiencing, uh, far more uh, trials than we experience. And so we're going to be looking at Hebrews 11, verses 20 through 23. If you have your Bibles, would you join me as, as the writer of Hebrews continues to speak to Messianic Jews? That's really a, another name for this, this book, rather than uh, Hebrews. It, it was really written to the Jewish believers in the first century. And it certainly applies to us today, no matter what trials we're going through. And so, again, Hebrews 11, beginning in verses 20 through 23. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and worship as he leaned on the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions about his bones. By faith, Moses, his parents hid him from for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's eating. Well, let's pray. Father, we do thank you again for your word, and uh, Father, for the writer of Hebrews encouraging us and reminding us of our fathers in the faith, the, the, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and uh, the patriarchs. Lord, may we learn from their examples of faith and uh, better understand the elements of what faith is, not simply merely intellectual assent, Lord God, but the transfer of trust from ourselves and circumstances to you, the unseen but ever-living God. Bless us as we look into your word, we pray. B'Shem Yeshua. Amen. Well, moving faith from theory to reality is essential if we're going to experience the blessings of God's promises to those who come to him. It's always easier to talk faith than it is to walk faith. By nature, you and I fight the concept of faith constantly. We tend to resist trusting God. We'd rather walk by sight, since that's a lot more predictable. But walking by sight, we're told in Scripture, doesn't please God. We often also stumble in our faith when we fail and just want to quit this life of faith and and this walk with God. We just want to just leave it all at times. For example, in 2 Corinthians, we read this, that is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. For our present troubles are quite small and won't last very long, yet they produce for us an immeasurably great glory that will last forever. So we don't look at our troubles that we can see right now. Rather, we look forward to what we've not yet seen. For the troubles we see will soon be over, but the joys to come will last forever. And in 2 Corinthians, we read this, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Well, the best place to teach and to learn and to cultivate faith is in the home with our families. I mean, that is the place where actual faith is worked out. Our family sees us and knows us, everything about us. In our passage before us this, e this, this morning, we have four examples of families and faith operating in them. These four families provide us with illustrations of the rewards of faith, despite behavior that at times demonstrated both the best and the worst of conduct. It's wonderful to know that even though we stumble, faith goes on and that God is faithful to us, even though we may not be faithful to him. And in these examples, we see the highs and lows of that work, worked out. First of all, we see in verse 20 of Hebrews 11, the faith illustrated in Isaac's life. In verse 20, we read, by faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau, even regarding things to come. Genesis chapter 27 chronicles the chain of events 
involved in this particular incident. Isaac was a worldly man in many ways. In fact, there's less written about Isaac than any of the other patriarchs. He sought to give the birthright to Isaac when God had made it quite clear that the blessing was to go to Jacob. In Genesis chapter 25, we learn that Esau cared more for himself than for the things of God. Jacob valued God's blessing, on the other hand, through Isaac. In Genesis 25, we read this in verse 27 and 28. The boys grew up, that is uh, Isaac and, uh, I mean, rather Esau and Jacob. The boys grew up and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was a quiet man, staying among the tents. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Esau, however, sold any rights that he may have thought he had with regard to the birthright. He think thinking that he was the firstborn, he thought he was entitled to the birthright, but he sold those birthrights, that birthright. And in Genesis chapter 25, we read about it in verse 30, we read this, when Jacob had cooked stew, Esau came in from the field and was famished. And Esau said to Jacob, please let me have a swallow of that red stuff there, for I'm famished. Therefore, his name was called Edom. But Jacob said, first sell me your birthright. And Esau said, behold, I'm about to die. So what is it of use is this birthright to me? And Jacob said, first swear to me. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went on his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. So after wrongly attempting to give the blessing to Jacob, uh, uh, that is, Isaac uh, wrongly attempting to give the blessing to Jacob, he seems to realize the seriousness of nearly disobeying God. We find him trembling when, he is, when Esau comes to him after he had blessed Jacob, thinking it was Esau. Uh, join me again in Genesis 27. We see the scene of Isaac right after he blessed Jacob, thinking that he was Esau. You'll remember Jacob dressed up at his mother's behest and with his mother's uh, manipulation uh, as Esau. He dressed up as Esau and received the blessing, Isaac being very, uh, probably having cataracts, not being able to see. And, uh, and, and, and with uh, that subterfuge, he blessed Jacob, thinking he was blessing Isaac. Again, in Genesis 27, we read this in verse 30. Now, it came about as soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, and Jacob had hardly gone out from the presence of Isaac, his father, that Esau, his brother, came in from his hunting. Then he also made savory food and brought it to his father. And he said to his father, let my father arise and eat of his son's game that you may bless me. Isaac, his father, said to him, who are you? And he said, I'm your son, your firstborn, Esau. Then Isaac trembled violently and said, who is he that hunted game and brought it to me so that I ate of it and blessed, uh, ate of it all before you came and blessed him? Yes, and he shall be blessed. Well, I believe that trembling was an indication of the conviction that came to him over all that his resistance uh, had been revealed, all that he had resisted, the Lord, to what had been revealed to him and Rebekah concerning the blessing that was to go to Jacob. He was about to pass the blessing to Esau instead. And when he realized that, he trembled, realizing that, that he was responsible for Jacob uh, deceiving him. God overruled, and he, Isaac, trembled in conviction. But in the same way that Abraham's lapses of faith are passed over, based on the overall work through his life, so also we see that God passes over this unseemly scene of Isaac. Uh, Isaac's faith is recorded in Hebrews 11, because he knew that God overruled his mistake and disobedience, because we know that faith is not of works, as Isaac's life so clearly makes plain. Faith is by grace through faith, and that not of ourselves. It is the gift of God. We see God's uh, overruling his uh, actions uh, in the case of Isaac, 
and uh, and so we see it's the Lord really who is the, the the master and the foundation and the perfecter of our faith. There were consequences for Isaac's actions. Yes, when we have lapses of faith, when we do things that are in rebellion to God's revealed will, there are consequences. David is a classic example of that when he rebelled against the Lord and and had Uriah murdered when to cover up his sin with Bathsheba. And so there are consequences for, for our rebellion against God. But our faith is totally of God. And so the consequences for Isaac's um, uh, uh, ignorance or, or rebellion against the revealed will of God is it caused Rebekah to sin, his wife, and then causing Jacob to sin. Jacob was forced to flee, and Rebekah never saw her son again until they will be united, until they were united in heaven. Jacob wound up reaping what he sowed. He sowed deception, and boy, you talk about a guy who, who reaped deception in multiplicity. It is Jacob with Laban, who deceived him in marriage, marrying uh, Leah instead of Rachel. But again, God forgave Jacob's sin, but he had to live with the consequences of his actions. And so the first example we see of faith operating apart from, from works is in the life of Isaac and Rebekah and Jacob. Secondly, we see an example of faith in Jacob. In verse 21, by faith, Jacob, as he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshiped leaning on his staff. Jacob, by faith, passed the blessing on to his sons, in spite of a life whose actions demonstrate over and over again that he walked by sight and not by faith. In Jacob, we see God's grace overruling his worldly mistakes. Jacob's mature life began with an act of deceit, which we just looked at in, in, in uh, covering up uh, or dressing up as Esau. His life was like his father's in many ways. He was up and down spiritually. Sometimes he walked by faith, while other times he walked by sight. Jacob was a man who learned that it was one thing to have God as a redeemer and as a father, and another thing to have God as Lord. I mean, we make certain decisions in our life. We take back our life. But God calls us to surrender our lives to him. One of the evidences of faith is when we release our life to the Lord as our minds are renewed by God's word. It was when Jacob completed his experience with Laban that a real change in his life occurred. We read about it in Genesis 32 after God delivered him from the wrath of Laban, and he was preparing to meet his brother again, Esau, as he returned back from the land, having fled Laban and God delivering him from Laban's wrath. But even after, after this great encounter, do you remember that encounter in the scriptures in Genesis 32, where, where he, he is just fearful and, and worried as he's about to face Esau and, you know, knowing that Esau probably held a grudge. But even after that great encounter with the angel of the Lord, and, and that's what happened, the angel of the Lord appeared to him. That was actually the Lord himself, and Jacob wrestled with him. But even after that great encounter with the angel of the Lord and God's grace in that encounter with Laban, Jacob outwardly failed again in his relationship with his sons. For example, he favored Joseph over all the other sons, and his favoritism had the direct result of causing his sons to conspire against Joseph to kill him. Uh, yet in jo Genesis chapter 48, by faith, we read, Jacob passes the blessing to Joseph. For all his failure and consequences of his failure, he kept his faith and hope in God. Again, it was the, the Lord himself who lifted him up, and it was God's word that lifted him up. That's why I say over and over again, faith comes by hearing and hearing by God's word. Jacob, though he stumbled many times, just like you and I stumble many times, by reading God's word, our faith is strengthened. And so he blesses Joseph. Joseph became the firstborn by virtue of the failure of Reuben, 
when he defiled Jacob's concubine. We read, a, we read that about in scripture. And, and so Reuben was disqualified by having an affair with one of his concubines, Jacob's concubines. And Simeon and Levi were disqualified from the blessing. The second and third born sons because of their deceit with the sons of Hamor. In 1 Chronicles chapter 5, we're, we're told this. Now, the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, for he was the firstborn, but because he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given to the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel, so that he is not enrolled in the genealogy according to the birthright. That's what the Chronicle relates to us. So we see that Reuben was limited. And in Genesis 49, we hear Jacob's words with regard to Simeon and Levi, the second and third born sons. Simeon and Levi, he said, are brothers. Their swords are implements of violence. Let, let my soul not enter into their counsel. Let not my glory be united with their assembly, because in their anger, they slew men, and in their self-will they lamed oxen. Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it's cruel. I will disperse them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. And so it was that Simeon did not really have a identifiable uh, uh, territory in Israel. And of course, Levi, we know, uh, became the priests and were scattered throughout Israel and uh, had no land also. As, uh, as the word of uh, Jacob is relayed in that blessing. And so he gave to Joseph a double portion by blessing the two sons of Joseph and making them equal to his sons. Have you ever noticed that, that there's no tribe of Joseph? Well, actually, there is two tribes of Joseph. The sons of Joseph, Manasseh and Ephraim, became equal to the sons of Jacob. And so uh, he made, uh, Jacob made Joseph's sons equal to his own sons, even though they were grandsons. Though Jacob was dying in Egypt, he made a blessing with regard to the future and the possession of the land of promise, and he wanted his bones to be brought back to the promised land. And so that's the second example of faith. Again, we see a man who is as worldly as, as can be. You might say, how can God bless such a man who is such a deceiver, a, a person who time and time fails the Lord? Well, be encouraged, brothers and sisters, that, uh, that our faith is a gift from God, and he who has begun a good work in us will continue and perfect it. And, uh, and we see it at work in Jacob's life as Jacob finishes well but uh, had a struggle throughout his whole life because he walked many times by sight rather than by faith. But God brought him through it. And so there's the second example of faith in, in the history of our people. The third example is Joseph's faith. In verse 22 of Hebrews 11, by faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the exodus of the sons of Israel and gave orders concerning his bones. Joseph was 17 when he arrived in Egypt as a slave. He prospered greatly in Egypt. Even though he was betrayed by his brothers, God was with him all through that time. Yet in spite of all of his success and influence, he never gave up on the promises of God. His faith was deeply entrenched in his heart, in his life, and in his hopes. His faith was evidenced in his action toward his brothers. You could say that no good thing ever uh, was, uh, or rather, uh, um, no good deed was didn't go unpunished in Jacob's and Joseph's life. Joseph did one good thing after another and always wound up uh, being punished for his righteous acts. His faith, Joseph's faith, coupled with actions, bore fruit in saving the Jewish people. His his brothers, and all of us. He had an unswerving faith in the future of his family. Over and over, he experienced evil for good, and yet he trusted God through all of his trials. When he was sent to Egypt as a slave, he faced one betrayal after another, but he persisted in his trust and confidence, and in due time, he received the promises and the blessings from God. He went from the jailhouse to the, uh, to the highest level in, in all of Egyptian society. He reiterated the promise that the Lord would take care of Israel and bring them from Egypt to the land promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
by faith, he knew what the future held. He knew that before the promise could be fulfilled, Israel would, as a nation, have to come out of Egypt. He knew that. Joseph did not want to be counted in the history of Egypt, but rather of the future land and the people and the promises of Israel. While Joseph would be resurrected, he wanted to rise in the land of promise. He knew that the covenant of the land and the resurrection was certain, and that's why he made mention and made Israel swear that his bones would be buried in the promised land. And so he's our third example of faith, a great example of faith. Through, through all trials and difficulties, he persisted in that faith. And then we have, finally, the parents of Moses. In verse 23, we read this, By faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents, because they saw he was a beautiful child, and they were not afraid of the king's edict. This was a significant time of testing. Pharaoh saw Israel as a fifth column that would rise against him. I mean, you talk, this is really the foundation of anti Semitism, where a whole people, the Jewish people, are marked for annihilation, that all the male children should be killed. Uh, this is the first recorded act of genocide, and we know it's demonic at its very roots. The call by Pharaoh was to kill the sons of Israel and allow the daughters to live. Pharaoh marshaled all of his powers to ensure that his edict concerning the death of all male children was to be carried out. But the parents of Moses saw that this child was beautiful. This was a faith that saw the child as good or beautiful in the sight of God. It was a faith that gave them strength and courage to defy the king's Egypt uh, edict, even going against the uh, the, the edict of, uh, of Pharaoh and, and, and perhaps suffering death, but they stood up, they, they withstood the edict of Pharaoh. Their faith trusted God for the care of the child. They went against the government when the government defied God and his word. And there's a time where you and I must defy God's word. We know that the, uh, the midwives of, uh, of the Jewish people defied Pharaoh's edict to kill the male children. God rewarded them with children of their own, the first abortion issue, if you will, given by Pharaoh. They brought him, uh, uh, note that the, the parents of, uh, of Moses brought him to the Nile, where the sentence of death was to be carried out. They bring Moses to the Nile. Their belief that God had a special plan for Moses was rewarded by his escape from death. He not only escaped, but became one of the greatest sons of Israel. So what we see in these verses of Hebrews chapter 11 is that a, a faith uh, in action is not theoretical. It's something that we see operating in our families and in our home life. Even if our home life may not be the best in the world, God, through our faith, through the word, through the transformation of our minds through his word, can give us strength so that we can finish well. This is always the identifying mark in history of faith operating in our home and in our families. We need to remember, first of all, that our homes are training brace, bases and not holding tanks. God uses our home to train us and to transform us. So the trials that you experience at home are, are made to uh, transform you into the image of the Lord to make you men and women of God. Secondly, we need to develop in our homes a confidence of God. And remember that there are blessings for obedience and trust, not just for ourselves, but for our children as well. And though we stumble, God remains faithful. Rabbi Simlai, a teacher of, of Israel from the third century, noted that while Moses gave Israel 365 prohibitions, and 248 positive commands, thus we have the 613 commandments, David in Psalm 15 reduced the commandments to 11. Here's what he said, O Lord, who may abide in your tent? Who may dwell in your holy hill? And so he lists these 11 commandments. He said, he who walks with integrity and works righteousness and speaks truth in his heart, he does not slander with his tongue. Fifthly, nor does he do evil to his neighbor. Sixthly, nor takes up a reproach against his friend. Or seventhly, in whose eyes a reprobate is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord. 
Ninthly, he swears to his own hurt and does not change. Tenthly, he does not put his, out his money at interest, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things will never be shaken. And so David reduced the 613 to 11. And then in Isaiah, uh, Isaiah chapter 33 and verses 14 and 15, Isaiah reduced them to six. Well, we read this, sinners in, sinners in Zion are terrified, trembling as seize the godless. Who among us can leave, live with the consuming fire? Who among us can live with continual burning? And his answer is, one, he who walks righteously and speaks with sincerity. Two, three, he who rejects unjust gain. Four, shakes hands so that they hold no bribe. Fifthly, he who stops his ears from hearing about bloodshed, and sixthly, shuts his eyes from looking upon evil. Then Micah, the prophet Micah, after Isaiah, reduced them to three. In, I, in Micah 6, 8, he has told you, O man, what is good. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with God? And then Habakkuk reduced them to one, namely, the just shall live by faith. It is by faith that we're saved. It is by faith that we walk. And it is by faith that we find life and joy and peace. And faith, as we said, is strengthened by God's word. It will transform our lives and have an eternal impact, not only in our lives, but the lives of our children and everyone we come in contact with. These four illustrations from Hebrews chapter 11 and from the history of our fathers, the fathers in the faith, demonstrate further a life that is pleasing to the Lord our God. And if you will, would you join me in prayer? Ovina Malkano, our Father and our King, we thank you for these examples, Lord. We see men of flesh, men who stumble just as you and I stumble, Lord God, uh, or as uh, we stumble, Lord God. We thank you, Lord, for these examples that we can be encouraged, that, that we can walk like they did in faith. Help us, Father, to renew our minds by your word. Help us, Lord, not to just be hearers of your word, but doers as well. Strengthen our faith and transform us into the image of your Son, Messiah Yeshua, who reflects you in every aspect. Thank you for the Ruach, the spirit that you have given us through your word and through the outpouring of your spirit that transforms us into the image of your son. For it's in your name we pray. Amen.